this commence live streaming. Thanks, and I'll just confirmation back. Thank you, IT. To you, Madam Chair, we are now live. We'll just let in all the um, people from the in the lobby waiting in the lobby. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. And you, if you'll let me know when they're in, then I'll then I'll start the meeting. Um, I think one, I could ask all the speakers to pick their phone on mute, please. can't start the meeting until that noise goes. So if all of the people waiting to speak can please put their phones or their computers on mute. That sounds much better. Thank you. Well, good evening and welcome to this meeting of Bayside City Council's local planning panel. Uh, my name is Marcia Doherty and I'm the chair of this evening's meeting. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that we are all um, meeting on various Aboriginal lands and pay our respects to the uh, elders of the various lands past, present and emerging. Um, I'll just briefly talk about the purpose of the Bayside Local Planning Panel. The panel is charged with considering planning proposals of any scale and value and determining development applications where the value is less than 30 million dollars where there's a potential conflict of interest, where the development is contentious, where there is substantial departure from development standards or where it is a sensitive development. In particular, the panel must consider development applications which have attracted 10 or more unique objections in a public meeting. So this is a public meeting and we are considering these two development applications on the agenda tonight. Um, this one in particular because it has attracted um, 10 or more submissions. Other development applications which don't fall into any of the categories that I've just listed can be dealt with in non-public meetings of the local planning panel. Uh, this public meeting is being recorded and is live streamed to Council's YouTube page. The recording is an official record of Council and may be made available to persons upon request in accordance with the Freedom of Information legislation. Applicants and members of the public that have registered to speak on an item at this evening's meeting will be asked to unmute their phone or computer at the relevant time to address the panel and to answer any questions. Um, Various submissions have been prepared by members of the public and the, the panel has had the benefit of reading those submissions. Uh, once the panel has heard from all of the speakers, including applicants, we will um, adjourn the meeting and make our determination and that determination will be published on Council's website within the next few days. So before I invite um, members of the public to speak. We will introduce ourselves. My name is Marcia Doherty, as I said, and I'm the chair of this evening's meeting. My background is as a um, lawyer. I've worked as a lawyer for uh, about 30, 35, 36 years, and much of that time has been spent practicing environment and planning law. I also have expertise in governance and public administration, and I'm involved in other local and regional planning panels I'm also a member of various government committees and I'm a non-executive director of City West Housing Board, which is a community housing provider. Um, Jan, if I can ask you to please introduce yourself. Yes, good evening, everybody. I'm Jan Morell and I've been a planner for some 40 years. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. And Lindsay? 
You're on mute, Lindsay. Yes, good evening, everybody. Can't hear you, Lindsay. You might go across to Amber and Lindsay, you can work out what's happening. Amber? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'm the community representative tonight. I live in Bayside and have been raising my children here for many years. Um, I understand um, that DAs can be emotional. Um, I have sort of lived next door to um, DA process, you know, people going through those processes and I have, have had one myself when I renovated, so I understand the process. Um, I do know that some of these matters can be very difficult for the community, so I definitely aim to come at these matters um, with that in mind. Um, I have expertise in governance. I sit on the board of a charity as the chair and I have a full-time day job where I work in government relations. Thank you. Thanks, Amber. Lindsay, how are you going with your computer? Uh, can you hear me now? I can, thank you. Okay, excellent. I'm a consultant town planner. I have uh, qualifications in geography and town and country planning. I have a private practice in Sydney where I service local government clients, private clients, and I'm on this panel and three others. I'm also a member of the Planning Institute of Australia where I um, mentor younger planners each year. Thank you. Thanks very much, panel. Um, there are no apologies as far as I understand for this evening's meeting. Catherine, if you could just confirm that. To you, Madam Chair, that is correct. No apologies, thank you. Uh, in terms of disclosures of interest, each of the panel members has um, completed and signed a declarations of interest which says that, that which confirms that, that, they, that, that we do not have any conflicts of interest in relation to tonight's agenda items. But for the record, I'll just ask each of the um, panel members to confirm that they do not have any declarations of, of conflicts of interest this evening. I do not. Jan Morell, I have no conflict. No conflict. Amber O'Connell, no conflict. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Uh, we have no minutes of previous meetings and we have no planning proposals. So that takes us to the business for this evening's meeting. We have two development applications, both of which are for childcare centres. The first one is for 26 Culver Street, Monterey, and that's an application to demolish the existing buildings and construct a two-storey childcare centre with at-grade parking and with the childcare centre accommodating 20 children. The recommendation is to approve the development application. We have registered to speak seven people and uh, they are registered to speak against the recommendation to approve the development application. And we have uh, available um, to speak in favour of the recommendation to approve the development application um, two speakers on behalf of the applicant for the development application. So just a little bit of housekeeping for our speakers. Uh, each of you, so as I said earlier, we've all read your submissions and we've considered the responses to those submissions that appear in the um, council officers assessment report. Uh, each of you will have two minutes. It will have three, three minutes to address the panel. And uh, Ms. Bush, who's looking after the meeting on behalf of council this evening, will let you know when you've spoken for two minutes. When that happens, that means you need to wind up uh, and finish your submission. You only have one more minute to go after that two minute uh, time place. And there's no need to repeat what other people have said. Um, it's much more effective for you to just to call out the particular points that you'd like to make, um, which you, you think are particularly important to the committee. So I'll start off with Mr. Nguyen La. Through you, Madam Chair, I just remind the speakers that if you're not the speaker, if you could turn off your cameras so it's only the one speaker that has their camera and mic on. Thank you. So are you there, Mr La? Hello. Good evening, everyone. Can anyone hear me and see me? Hi, we can hear you and we can see you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your time this evening. Um, I'm here as um, a neighbouring uh, resident to the proposed property uh, for context and 
and want to object um, this proposal. Um, acknowledge that um, the child care centre is permissible within the zoning um, region. So wanted to go through uh, a couple of points that will clearly articulate the, the reason for the, the objection. One is the outdoor play area. It hasn't been detailed sufficiently around what the planning for the screen planting um, aspects are in terms of landscaping that could impede um, and encroach on the limited um, play area for the children. Um, there hasn't been clear identification around the rear access to the parking that hasn't been illustrated again that could encroach on the unencumbered area impacting the uh, seven square metre per child under the regulations. Um, and also information such as uh, plant machinery, um, other aspects such as location of sales chain, all these could compromise the unencumbered area that hasn't been clearly detailed. So we need further information to be able to assess that uh, appropriately. Mr. Lark, could I just interrupt? What was your second point? Your first point was about the landscaping impacting on children playing. What was the second point? I'm sorry, I just missed it. Um, Sorry, I'll just go through, I've, I've got this already submitted, but I'll go through them quickly with the time limitations. Um, the setback to the fence for the cantilever that occupies the width for the screen planting. Uh, the physical access to the rear parking area uh, yeah. to the main building, that hasn't been determining if it's swinging and it could be uh, impacting the unencumbered area. Um, also the relationship to the sail shade, the, the beam itself, again, could um, prohibit that area as well. Um, but also, um, so I'm just going through the, the plant machinery, you know, things that could also uh, be incorporated into the play area that hasn't been provided in detail that could affect that. So we need that information to assess it properly. Um, was that sufficient, Marcias, before I, Marcias, before I proceed? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, the second part is the traffic and parking. Um, the assessment was done during COVID. Um, there was work from home policies. It's um, the timestamps and the relevance around the day and the pattern of traffic has become irrelevant between now and then. Um, things have changed and things will continue to grow as the community becomes more and more um, you know, getting used to going back to life as normal. So also the consideration around the parking has changed in terms of Elmont Street. So. Um, with the changing factors of the time frame and also the considerations of the design, um, an appropriate assessment and a current relevant assessment needs to be undertaken to reflect the impacts of the community, both parking and traffic. Um, and that hasn't been um, taken into account as part of this consideration. The third point is the architectural design. Um, although the issue has been um, catered for under the council response that, you know, it can, comprises of the materials to build a house. It doesn't really um, cater for the landscape or the streetscape of the property, such as these large windows. Um, also the, um, sorry, I'm just going through my notes here. The large windows um, that no other buildings within the vicinity has, um, they're quite sizable and I've taken pictures of that to, to provide evidence associated with that within my submitted document. Um, in the back of the garage as well, in terms of the uh, car, park, car parking to Ev Emmeline Street, um, again, it's not enclosed, it's open, which will introduce um, all sorts of um, activities that you're not aware of or could be in the future that could impact the residents directly. Um, as you can see, across the Emlyn Street, there is enclosed uh, garages or some form of enclosure to prevent you know, um, unwanted access. Um, my fourth point is loss of visual privacy. So there's a sizable, sorry, say that again. Three minutes is up now. I thought I was going to give two minute warning. Yeah, there was a two minute warning. Did you not hear it? No, I was talking. I didn't acknowledge that. If you Sorry, could just, um, well, if you, if you, if ordinarily we wouldn't be too strict, but we've got many speakers here tonight, <laughs> Mr. Lars. So if you wouldn't mind just making your final points. Yeah. Okay. Loss of visual privacy. Um, the <laughs> the window well, which is a sizable window that um, looks directly into the adjacent property, um, with um, yeah. You know, people that are known that can actually peer into the neighbouring property. So there's a visual loss around that as well. So in summary, there's insufficient information to make an appropriate assessment. And those three three or four points I've highlighted needs to be assessed appropriately before a decision can be made. 
Thanks, Mr. Lauren. Can you just let us know where in relation to the proposed development you live? I live in 24 Culver Street. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Panel, any questions for Mr. Lauren? No questions for me, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Lauren. Uh, Mr. George, George, George Kapoulos, it's our next speaker. You there, Mr. George, George Kapoulos? Uh, yes, it's George Kapoulos. Sorry for my mispronunciation. That's OK. Um, I've, uh, I'm at number 28, uh, so the neighbouring property. Um, I've raised a number of points and submitted those through uh, as part of this submission. Yes, and we've uh, all read, we've all read your submission. Thank you very much. If, if, right. if there's anything in particular that you really wanted thought felt was very important that you'd like to draw to our attention. Well, I think the three points, but not not against um, progress <coughs> and development, but my concern is similar right. to uh, New and Lyle's uh, concern that we haven't got the information to make a uh, determination. Um, the canter, the, having a counter levered fence and then uh, in my report or my submission I made reference to the fact that the plant that they're going to put in there that's meant to grow to three metres needs sizable um, space for that to occur. Um, so the drawings and the plans that have been provided do not clearly show us how that is going to be achieved. My concern uh, is that we're going to get to the property being completed the fence being put up as one of the last things to um, to to complete, the landscaping going in, and then someone saying, "Oh, we can't achieve it." If we can't achieve it now in a drawing, how are we going to achieve it later? And then it will be left for us neighbours and Coles Street residents to um, compromise because the development has been completed. Um, so if we lose space in the backyard and it doesn't meet the 20, I'm sure that we're going to then, uh, as panel or council, will just go ahead with it. It's the same thing with um, the points that we made reference to around the parking and the traffic. Um, I'm not sure that the Bayside Traffic Advisory Committee was made aware of the 29, um, uh, uh, the Montessori um, school that's across the road at number 29 and the 25 placements they have. They, were they made aware of the Benevolence Society having a um, two properties now? They only had one before, but Rosemore Cottage is, you, has got one and three uh, Culver Street. Um, so we're, we've got this additional burden that wasn't there before, and that's why we're saying we'd like a proper traffic report, a proper traffic count. And even when I look at this landscaping, and I'll just end it with my last point, with this landscaping, these three metre high trees that are going to be placed near the front of the property um, next to that driveway where parents are meant to drive in in a reverse manner and drive out. They'll only visually get to see if someone's walking down the street, they'll only visually get to see them as they cross the council curb. So, you know, we, we, have we factored that in? And this is where, where, again, once it's built, we can't go back. So we want to make sure that what is being presented, we've made a um, you know clear uh, judgment on. Uh, there's a non-trafficable um, uh, light well that that has referenced, and council is in their recommendation is saying no to to that. Um, that they they can't um, change that at some later stage. But again, if this doesn't, if this is not a viable project at 20. Um, kids, what happens then? We're going to turn to council. We're going to have this white elephant. Anyway, thanks very I, much. I hope, Th I hope thank that you. makes sense. Yep, no, that's great. Thank you very much for that submission. Um, yeah. uh, we also have uh, Mrs. Denise Georgia Kapoulos. Um, yes, I've got her here with me and she'll use my logging. Okay. Um, Catherine, we. I don't think the speakers can hear you when you say two minutes, so I don't know whether it's going to work. If you just put up two your fingers for two minutes, then I can I can tell the speakers that that that's two minutes. Thank okay. you. The bell as well or not? No. No. Well, we, no, because we, we're not we can't hear the bell for some reason. It's just not working. So um, thank you, uh, Mrs. Georgia Kapoulos. 
Yes, here. Can you can the panel hear me? Hi. Okay? Yep, we can see you and we can hear you. Thanks very much for attending. Fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm pleading to the council and the uh, panel to really consider my palm um, above points of uh, objection. May I start off by saying, and this may not have been captured, but many residents immediately affected by this development were unable to have their voices heard tonight, including those at 25, 23 and 30, and several others because they're either elderly or unable to navigate the online process or were simply not advised by the council of the significance of this panel meeting. Uh, with that in mind, I do believe that the council may not have been listening genuinely to the, uh, respectfully of our concerns and how um, we will be affected by this development. Um, I understand that council wants to service the community and approval of this development, I believe, would not take into consideration the notion that residents should be sharing the responsibility of community service. It's inconceivable to me that a residential street of only 60 houses has already supported in the community with three fully functional operational businesses. They are functional now and have been for some time. So they include, as previously mentioned, the Montessori Child Care Centre at 29 and Rosemore Cottage, which is the aged care and respite facility, and they're currently running out of three and one as well. So the approval of this Child Care Centre at 26 would effectively mean a fourth commercial venture to be operating in is what a small residential street. Uh, on a very personal panel, um, so on a personal level, I'd like the panel to consider how this would development would affect my ability to service the community in a way I've been doing for over 20 years. I'm a paediatric intensive care nurse that works in a busy children's hospital, and for a long time I've been working large proportion of mainly night shifts. This is where my expertise is most needed, and this is the best way I can service the community with my many years of experience. The only reason I'm able to work safely in such a demanding role is because I can sleep during the day in what is a very quiet residential street. There is nothing in the development proposal in regards to noise minimisation that reassures me that I'll be able to continue working many nights where I've been needed the most. Mm -hmm. The strategy suggested by the proposal places the burden on me and other residents to voice complaints to the operator, and that just seems a bit unacceptable. The council might not be very concerned about how this development affects Mrs. individuals. George, but boss, you have one yes. more minute, so if you would. Yeah, I would like you to consider that effectively this would mean one less highly experienced nurse that will be able to um, look after your children and your grandchildren should they ever end up in an ICU. And no one, no one ever expects this to happen to them. And I can assure you it does happen to families when they least expect it. So it's heartbreaking to me that this approval would mean I would no longer be able to continue doing my role and service the community for as long as I have been. The fourth venture, a petite, well, uh, four, two childcare centres and uh, two aged care facilities would effectively also increase the environmental impact and increase the activity, energy usage, traffic and noise and additional waste of all concerns. So just, I'd like the panel to please consider all these points before we can go any further. Thank you very much for uh, raising those and thank you for your good work at nursing as well. The community really- Thank you for pointing pointing out the two minutes because I believe the previous two speakers wouldn't have seen it. So that you pointing it out there was a bit clearer. Thank you for that. That's helpful. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Mr. Mark Raimondo, on behalf of multiple residents. Yes, good evening. Yep, can I commence? You can, thank you. Yep. Okay, good evening, Madam Chair and Bayside Local Planning Panel members. Uh, my name is Mark Ramondo. I'm a, a consultant town planner for Maximus Phelps Australia, um, representing multiple owners uh, which you, uh, in, in, in the street, which includes uh, number 28 uh, Culver and number uh, 24 Culver Street, which you've already heard from Mr. Nguyen La and uh, George Jokopoulos. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that it's appreciated that the design has been I guess amended from the original proposal. Um, that is you know, a fact. Um, but I guess what I'm kind of getting at is, look, we, there are still some some concerns in relation to the proposal. Um, so first, in relation to car parking. So it's understood that yes, there are three car parking spaces provided. However, it is considered that there should be appropriate consideration in, in relation to on-street car parking demand. So on the basis of the original traffic study, it only documented one day. Um, my understanding from the you know. As in industry practice, you would generally have at least about five days or so to have a proper reputable traffic count. Um, that's also referenced within the uh, Bayside DA checklist, to make, which also makes reference to results of traffic counts. The concern I have is, is that the traffic count was done prior to COVID, um, but also the dates which were given um, on page 110, so the attachment eight, uh, make reference to days. There, there's pretty much seven days, I think, seven days which generally don't conform with the peak operational uh, period 
uh, times of you know 7 a.m. to, to 9 a.m. in the morning and and you know, as they say 6 uh, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. so the concern I have is there's only one day which has got a, a traffic count there should have been at least five um, and the reliance upon other near map dates which don't really have any relevance some days are there on Sunday um, other days which don't have any relevance in relation to the peak operational requirements um, aren't considered to be of any material value so what I'm kind of getting at on this basis and consideration that there is a Montessori childcare centre you know, 24 metres away, that's pretty much diagonally across the road. Um, that does, they, they, you know, given, I do acknowledge that there is compliant car parking on site, but in a logical and comfortable position, you would rather have a proper traffic report to understand, to demonstrate what, what impact there is in relation to what's actually happening on Culver Street. In this instance, unfortunately, I believe that hasn't been done. Um, so two minutes left, is it? One, one minute left. Okay, one minute left. Uh, okay, Thank in you. relation to acoustic fencing, um, just as I think George, George and uh, Nguyen mentioned, I believe that there's inconsistency in relation to the uh, acoustic fence, um, and which should be looked into further detail, and as well as landscaping. Um, in relation to stage shade structure, I believe that there should be sufficient documentation provided on the plans and not just conditioned as per condition 27. So it's more beneficial if that information was actually provided to ascertain if there's any visual or, or potential overshadowing impacts. Um, in relation to waste, uh, there's a waste storage condition number 81, which makes reference to bin storage to be set back 900 millimetres away from a side boundary in a enclosed structure. Uh, it's requested that there's there would be a kindly requested that there would be an additional screen planting along the side boundary um, to create some additional you know, spatial separation visual visual buffer to minimise potential storage in that location. Um, on that basis, it's re requested that the Bayside Local Planning Panel defer the item for additional information. Uh, first being a revised traffic study to at least uh, capture one week's of, of traffic. Uh, confirmation from the acoustic engineer that there's no conflict between the 1.8 metre screen and, and cantilever works, and it indeed works. Um, clarification that the landscape area um, and planting does not you know, Im impede or impact the number of children. Um, and the additional landscape imposed along the eastern side boundary next to the uh, bin uh, enclosure is conditioned to provide additional amenity. Um, that's it. Thank you. Could you just um, clarify that last point about the bins and the? Yeah, yeah, so, yep, sure thing. Sorry, I was just rushing. I didn't want to. Take no, I know you were. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, so there is a condition which makes reference to where, where the bin storage area is. There's, yeah. if you look at on the, on the landscape plan, for example, I imagine on the landscape plan, there's there's a condition which which says it's got to be enclosed. Now, with that bin enclosure. It talks about a setback of 900 millimetres. What would like ideally is some type of spatial separation, um, a landscaping buffer of 900. So what it would be doing is carrying that landscaping through. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Raimondo. Any questions for Mr. Raimondo? For me, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you all, thank you, thank you. Um, our next speaker is Ms. Olga Giannoulis. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear and can you hear you and can, see me? We can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know that you don't want people repeating the same things, and I've already sent my submission, so I won't waste anyone's time. But basically, I am um, speaking on behalf of my parents who are neighbours and um, were quite um, unable to attend, as as everyone has said before, because of the technology um, uh, um, abilities to sign on. So um, I, I think that may be something you guys want to consider going forward, because I think that's unfair. That's sort of penalising a, a large part of the population and giving them their ability to voice an opinion. Um, everyone has basically said everything that I was going to raise. But my biggest concern is um, then making the residents responsible for making sure that the building is compliant and the noise restrictions are made. I don't think it's fair that neighbours are required to follow that up. Uh, I, I think it can cause conflict um, and I don't think it's appropriate. And, um, and should there be problems, will there be a review by council? Will you be providing people that we can speak to on behalf um, of situations raised? Um, again, I don't, I don't think that it's probable and likely that elderly people will be going into conflict with these people if there are issues or noise um, noise complaints. Um, as I said, everything else has been covered by everyone else, so I won't waste anyone else's time. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, uh, Miss Diana Bugarczyk. Bugarczyk.
Through you, Madam Chair. We have, Di we have through, Diana. Through you, Madam Chair, um, Miss Diana and the next speaker are only written submissions. Written so. submissions. Okay, thank you. So that's the end of the um, speakers and thank you very much all of the speakers for um, logging in and we I, I know we have speakers for the on behalf of the applicant. Through you Madam Chair, sorry there is two, still two speakers for the officer's recommendation. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah, I know, I know that. Thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to thank the neighbours for taking the time to 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 uh, log in and, and speak to us this evening. That's been really helpful. Now we have to speak for the officer's recommendation, which is to approve the development application. We have Mr. Alok Sabney and Mr. Sheriff Saad. Um, you're invited to speak to the panel and perhaps pick up on any of the issues that have been raised by um, the, the previous speakers, um, particularly in relation to um, some of the key points for me were acoustic issues and traffic um, and um, landscaping. Uh, good evening, Speaker. Uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, speak. Um, with regards to traffic, uh, we have come. So, firstly, I would like to thank the Council because we worked with Council quite in detail to amend the proposal to reflect the concerns which Council um, and the neighbours had uh, through Council. So we've amended the scheme, as uh, you might be aware. Um, in terms of the traffic, uh, we do comply with the Council's uh, requirements. Um, uh, the or just a quick reflection of the, the process. We originally had all the parking spaces from Culver Street and we have then amended it to have uh, the staff parking from the from the other street to um, satisfy council's um, requests and concerns. Um, in terms of the landscape and outdoor play area, uh, we have on our plan show uh, demonstrated compliance with the outdoor play in terms of numericals. We <coughs> with <coughs> sorry, uh, in in terms of the screen uh, planting, uh, we there is no it's a deep soil screen planting so we do have uh, our consultants um, agreeing and the council agreeing that the 900 deep soil uh, would be enough to have a substantial screen planting all um, along the outdoor play area including uh, the area near the bin uh, storage as well so the screen planting is proposed to go through um, in terms of the acoustics, uh, again, we have complied with the acoustics, um, acoustic consultant reports, and uh, we will be, um, th the operators will be uh, complying with the, the way the groups are going to play in like zero to uh, three will be a group A will play at one point, and then three to five will play at the other point, which is considered as an acceptable outcome uh, from acoustic and also from the operations perspective. Um, uh, with that, I think, uh, Madam Chair, if you want to raise any questions, I'm here to um, clarify anything if I missed. I just wanted to um, ask you to confirm. So one of the conditions of consent requires a plan of management and that and a plan of management has been submitted um, on behalf of your client to council. And that deals with a number of the issues that have been uh, raised by people making submissions this evening. Yep. And because that's a condition of consent uh, that that plan of management be complied with, if there are, for example, any complaints by neighbours of noise or parking infringements or um, the like, um, that will be actually a breach of the condition of consent and that means that council is able to take um, enforcement action in relation to that. So that's a really important part of the proposal, that plan of management. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, we we we've, we've made that. Um, yes, we'll we'll re restate that to the operators and and the landlord to make sure that they understand the um, um, the importance of the plan of management. And did the plan of management propose? I can't recall whether the plan of management proposed any sort of community meeting, any sort of regular meeting, where community members could come along and and speak to the operators to raise any issues that they were experiencing. Um, I don't think we have proposed anything of that on those lines. Um, I suppose if the council and the panel feels that's the um, necessary step uh, to be taken, uh, I'm sure we can um, 
look into it. Um, to co like, I mean, at the end of the day, we will be complying with the consent condition. So if it is part of the consent condition, we will comply with it. That, that can be a good uh, option for community members and neighbours to have that formalised way of speaking to the business and raising any issues rather than ad hoc complaints. It's a, it's a good way to communicate for both sides, actually. Sure. Um, Madam Chair, just confirming there's no mechanism in the plan of management that's proposed and attached to the consent for anything like that. So something we could perhaps look at. We could consider that. Right. Thanks mm -hmm. very much. Um, I'll invite the panel to um, ask any questions of um, the applicant's representatives or to make any comments they'd like to make in relation to this development application. You're, you're on mute, uh, Jan. I'm saying, no, I've got enough information. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think that's it for this development application. Um, just to explain the process again. So firstly, I'd like to thank very much all of the members of the community that have taken the time to speak to the panel this evening. That's greatly appreciated. We will we have another development application to deal with now. And after that, the panel will um, continue our discussions about these applications and reach a determination and that decision will be published on Council's website in the next few days. So thank you again for attending this evening's meeting. You can all log off now and we'll move to... Sorry, Madam Chair, sorry. Um, there was a Mr Sheriff's SAB registered as well. Yes, I wasn't sure whether Mr Sabne was speaking on his behalf, but uh, if, Mr Saad, if there was anything else that you would wanted to say, no, thank you so much. I think Mr. Sabni has covered everything. Thank you. All right. OK, thank you. Thanks, Catherine. So we'll just let the speakers for the for, for the previous item leave and then we'll move to the next agenda item. You think we're right to go, Catherine? Through you, Madam Chair, yes, we are Thank ready you. to go. Thank you. So this next item on tonight's agenda is 16 Segenho Street, Arncliffe, also a childcare centre. This is... Um, This is a larger childcare centre, so this one is um, to accommodate 68 children and the recommendation of the council staff is for refusal of this development application. We have um, four people registered to speak um, for the officer's recommendation and we have Mr Gerard Gerissi registered to speak against the officer's recommendation to refuse the development application. So I'll start off by inviting Mr. Peter Roditis to um, address the panel. You there, Mr. Roditis? Yes, I am. Good evening. Oh, hi there. Okay. So you, you have three minutes to address the panel and we'll okay. let you, we will we'll, we'll get into it. to let you know when you've, when you've got to your two minutes. Okay, thank you. My concerns have and always be, will be about the safety. Um, Look, removing a driveway from the front and making the main exit from the entrance from the back rear lane, there's no curb, no gutter, no footpath. There is currently people that walk their kids to school through the rear lane. There is a school with 600 kids already across the road from the application. Um, safety, the double parking, the cars overtaking on the wrong side of the road, it's it's horrendous there already. There's been three, I drive tow trucks in the area, I chase accidents. There's been three accidents in the street already. The application's right next to an S-bend out the front. I actually had a head on myself in my tow truck on the bend. If you turn into Sedgino Street from Wickham Street, you're on the wrong side of the road because there's four parked cars as soon as you turn into the street. 
every uh, every morning and every afternoon, 600 kids, there's got to be three, 400 cars picking up and dropping off. They've got to come out on Wickham Street or go around the side streets. Now, there's already currently a New South Wales parliamentary inquiry on the traffic that's on Wickham Street, Forest Road. It's gone from 600 trucks to 2,500 trucks that are coming off the M5, detouring the tolls on the M5 using these streets. Now, if you're coming down Forest Road, you cannot turn right onto Princess Highway. They've the erected a no right turn sign. So everyone, the rat run. There's a sign there, no right turn. Sorry, that's a scanner going, another accident. Anyway, um, so they, sorry about that. Um, so they can't turn right onto the highway. There's a no right turn sign to turn into Wickham Street, but they still turn in because they've got to get down the highway. So they're driving past the school in peak hour, kids getting picked up and dropped off. There's going to be another 60 kids on top of the 600 that are in the school already. Mr. Radicis, if you can, um, you, you're up to your two minutes, so I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if you could make your final point, thank you. Okay. Um, look, damage to the adjoining properties, when they start jackhammering and um, digging to get their car park and underground parking organised, will definitely be damaged because my parents live in the property right behind the application of the, of the childcare. They built five villas. They jackhammered and grinded and dug for two months to make the underground parking for eight cars. My parents' property got a crack from the bottom to the top. No one wanted to know about it. They said you should have got it inspected before the jackhammering and grinding happened because all the houses here are built on rock. To get an underground parking, they'll be jackhammering and drilling and grinding for at least a couple of months to suit the eight cars. My parents' property is damaged and no one's viable for it because my parents didn't get it inspected. So, look, safety, you can't have an entry to a childcare through a rear lane which people walk their kids to school and there's no curb, gutter, footpath or even street lighting there. Thanks, Mr. Thanks very much, Mr. Radidis. We've um, we've okay. run out of time, but we appreciate um, your comments to the panel. And I've put an application in in paper, pen and paper, and there's a lot more points on that. Yes, for everyone no, to look we've at. all read we've read the submission, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Milgate. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. I'll be very brief. This uh, application should not be approved in the interest of child safety. I've lived in Sedgenow Street for 30 years. My four children went to this school. Uh, I've been in that precinct on numerous occasions. I've driven up the street hundreds of times. Uh, the problem with this development is it will bring a convergence of hazards. Uh, they have to be looked at in that context. The convergence of hazards will be uh, the gathering of children that, uh, that come on the uh, entry and exit to the school, but particularly the exit to the school. So the gathering of children, this S-Bend that Peter talked about is real. Uh, it's quite a startling uh, thing for anybody, particularly those that aren't used to the street. If you're coming up that street and this, you come across this chicane S-Bend, people uh, are a little bit uncertain of what's happening and this development takes place right near this S-Bend. Uh, you you um, converge that with, and then the third one, of course, is traffic. You throw in a bit of rain and bad weather, you've got a perfect storm. Now, when we talk about street traffic on Sejano Street, if there's a disruption to any of the highways or surroundings, Sejano Street becomes a major thoroughfare, like it becomes gridlock. So we're talking about situations where the traffic can change dramatically. It can be quiet one day, and then it can become very, very busy as people seek to bypass some of the uh, blockages in the in, at, at the highway. So this convergence of hazards makes this a very unsuitable location for a childcare centre. It's an overdevelopment on a small residential block and the children's rights have to be protected. Children cannot enforce their own rights. It's up to us as adults to act on their behalf and insist that they be the priority in all of this. So I commend council for rejecting this proposal 
Unfortunately, it is in the wrong location. It needs to be rethought by the operators. In my view, it's an accident waiting to happen. And I think none of us want to be party of that, particularly when it's so obvious. Accident can happen at any time, but this is obvious what's going to happen. And those of us that use the street and know the dangers of this particular precinct at certain times under certain conditions are very, very concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Milgate. And Stephen Maraca. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. As a community, we're constantly talking about mental health and are you OK? This proposal over the last six years has caused myself and my family so much stress and anxiety at a time when I've had to support all three family members through various illnesses. So I fully support the council officer's recommendations to, re to reject this proposal and all the points that he made. I would also like to highlight the fact that all the previous councillors that voted also voted no to this proposal. Um, I was going to talk about the three car accidents that we've had in our street in the past five years, but I won't go through them because of the time restraints. And we've also had a number of small bingles and the council is constantly fixing up the road signs because the cars are hit, because the cars constantly hit the road signs in our area. Um, the, I'd like to highlight the fact that the council's mm. own rules state that the road should be 12 metres wide, uh, clear lines of sight. Sejano Street is under 11 metres wide, and the S bend is less than 20 metres away. Um, and we have multiple blind spots, and I don't have time to go through all the blind spots. Um, and our laneway is only five metres wide. Um, these rules are there for the safety of the children, and the council's own rules, in my opinion, should not be bypassed for any reasons. Our roads are simply too narrow and too dangerous. The extra noise, we already live directly across the road from the public school and we already live with so much noise. Um, we've never complained before. Um, with the childcare centre next door, this is just beyond reasonable. We have nowhere to go. It's, it's just going to be too much noise. The council recommends not having two facilities close to each other. We will have four. The shadowing um, will totally block all of our sun. Um, I'm so, excuse me for interrupting, Mr Maraca, but that's, that's two minutes. You have one more minute to go. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, we was up to um, uh, with the, uh, shadowing, shadowing, sun. shadowing totally block our sun uh, and they want to add a second storey level of, of brickworks which will make it even worse, mm. uh, the shadowing even worse. When they had the land environment meeting, the on-site meeting was conducted during school holidays so there was no children around. So the commissioner didn't get to see what the residents see and what the uh, council sees. Their traffic report didn't mention the S bend or the busy school drop off and pick up times. So, in my opinion, this report is incomplete. Their diagram showing the vehicle exiting their garage doesn't show the fence blocking the view. So, cars exiting their garage will not be able to see cars coming up the street. So, final, my final thing is please support the community and the council officers. <laughs> and reject this development. The site location is just too dangerous and goes against Council's own rules and regulations. Sorry, I'm very nervous. So thank you. Thank you for your time. You did well. Thanks, Mr Morocco. Thanks very much. Very helpful. Um, Mr Larry Diamond is our last speaker um, against the, uh, sorry, to support the recommendation of refusal. You there, Mr Diamond? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just going to call um, Mr Diamond because he was having trouble. Okay, just thank you. Oh, hello, Larry. You're um, you're in on the planning panel meeting now. It's live. If you'd yeah, like okay. to address the Madam Chair. Um, she'll yes. just call, call your name out now. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Mr Diamond. Are you there, um, able to address the panel? Uh, I am, Madam. Yeah. Uh, good, e good evening, everybody. Yes, I'm ready. Hi. Thank you. If you'd like. So we've all we've all attended the site and we've read the submissions and we've read the 
Council assessment report. If so if you've got uh, three minutes, and we'll let you know when when you when you've gone into two of those minutes, and you've got one more minute to go. If you'd just like to address the panel on the points that you think are particularly important. Sure, sure, not a problem. Uh, shall I start now? Then are we all ready to go? Yes, we're ready to go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, this this uh, proposed childcare centre uh, would bring a large amount of extra traffic movements to this already badly affected area. Uh, 69 children dropped off uh, and then picked up. Uh, that would be a lot of extra traffic movements to the area. Uh, the rear laneway Sedgenhold Lane uh, is exactly that. It's a laneway. It's never intended for large volumes of traffic. Uh, there is no footpath or street lighting in, in this laneway. Uh, the 90 degree blind bend on Sejinho Lane can only accommodate one car at a time. Uh, and this area <laughs> overrun with traffic from Ironcliffe Public School and traffic shortcutting through the streets. Uh, the recent introduction of a no right hand turn from Wickham Street onto Princess Highway going south uh, has made a huge increase in cars shortcutting through Sedgenhoe Street past Arncliffe Public School. Uh, this, this is not the right location for this childcare centre. So on this, I'd say this DA should not be approved. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Diamond. OK, all the best. Thank bye. You. Sorry, was there, was there something else that you want to say, Mr. Diamond? I didn't I didn't mean to interrupt you. I thought you'd finished. After you, Madam Chair, yes, he had finished. He said goodbye and he hung up. Great. Thank OK, thank you. Thanks. OK, well, um, thank you very much for the members of the community that have spoken to the panel this evening. We now have Mr. Jared Turisi who is here to speak on behalf of the applicant in the development application. And Mr. Teresi is speaking against the recommendation to refuse the development application. Please go um, ahead, Mr. Teresi, if there's anything you'd like to say in particular to respond to any of the key points that the, um, the neighbours have raised. Sure. Um, uh, Madam Chair, probably when I go through my presentation, I'll be addressing the issues which were raised by the previous speakers. Um, as you probably know, this is a matter which was deferred back in April from the previous local planning panel uh, to allow us to provide additional information. And although the officers have agreed in part to some of the changes that that's acceptable, there's still matters which are unresolved in their opinion. Um, we have reduced the number of children to reflect the open space provisions and therefore we do comply with the guidelines. Um, the council staff seem to be still concerned about the terraces proposed to the front and to the rear. Um, to the front, there are two terraces that are only 450 millimetres each in height with low planting in front of them. So uh, we've detailed that in our landscape plan and the 3D image clearly illustrates that the presentation of the building to the street is still will be dominant. It's not going to be in a sunken hole, which I think was what the panel of the officers were originally uh, concerned about. So we'll still have a very strong presentation to the street. And I note it's only for pedestrian purposes. Um, to the rear, uh, there is a terrace which is above the driveway uh, at its worst point, 890 millimetres higher than natural ground level. But it's also important to note there's no level changes to the side of the boundary. It's actually just simply the terrace, which is off the building. Um, and from my experiences, that sort of height is not considered to be excessive. And as the plans show, there is appropriate screening um, on those balconies or on those terraces to deal with privacy uh, issues. So there's no amenity concerns. Um, the site has an FSR control of 1.25 as to 1 and a height control of 12 metres. This proposal has a height of 9.21 metres and FSR of 1.08, so it's well below the actual height controls and density uh, allowed on the site. Uh, the proposal, uh, those controls also help determine built form outcome, and there seems to be a lot of discussion about this built form. Um, the concern about the extended walls along the upper terrace to the side boundaries are, in my view, an appropriate built form outcome 
as they have been integrated architecturally in the building design rather than providing a screen solution. And if you look at the older plans and part of the original report, you can see the previous option. And from my perspective, the actual proposal with those walls is a far better outcome. Um, even if you, and we've done the exercise of calculating that area and including the terrace on the ground and on the first floor as FSR because of the fact that we do have screens around them. And our FSR is still the 1.08 is to 1. So again, it's a clear demonstration that even if you include those terraces as a GFA calc, the building overall in terms of its mass and form is not an overdevelopment of the site. There has been a reference uh, for the first time in the report about um, the covered terrace um, being basically um, unacceptable and contrary to the provisions. Um, I think it's important to look at the context of the control in the guidelines. Um, the outdoor space is not actually roofed uh, in terms of the upper level. It actually has a shade cloth. And if there is a concern about it being too large, then it can be reduced. The shade cloth is away from the terrace edge, keeping the space as an open environment. Uh, the applicant, uh, the application of the control actually refers to verandas as they have a roof over it. I don't see this as a veranda. Um, the other issue is important to note is that under the guidelines, there is a need to provide a significant amount of shading for childcare centres. Uh, actually, the guidelines say that you only should be providing 30% of your open space for solar access with the remaining potentially being shaded area. So again, we meet those requirements. So um, we don't see that these terraces are, uh, are not appropriately designed or appropriate for this development. Um, the concern about the landscaping, we seem to, there's concerns raised the fact that we've used turf. By definition, turf does form part of landscaping under the planning definitions. Um, and the council's DCP requires 20% of the site to be landscaped. Even if you exclude the turf area down the southern side, we've got 22% of the site is landscaped. If you actually include the turf area, we're 25.7% of the site is landscaped. So I don't quite understand why there is a concern about landscaping when we clearly comply with the council's controls. Um, We've addressed the design excellence provisions in our original statement of environmental effects from pages 28 Mr. to 32. Mr. Teresa, if you could make your, um, your you just, I'm so, very sorry to interrupt you, but if you could just make your last um, points because I don't want to give you more, more time than I've given the other speakers. I understand that, but I guess there was four speakers, uh, Madam Chair, whereas I'm trying to address a fair few yeah, issues. Yeah. Um, so, um, so obviously we have addressed the design excellence and we feel that the development does meet those standards. Um, in terms of the overshadowing um, to the south, um, the council's DCP says for a dwelling house, a uh, uh, private open space requirement is only 80 square metres. Uh, the control says that 50% of that needs to be, have three hours of solar access. Our shadow diagrams clearly illustrate that between 79 to 111 square metres of that rear open space achieves solar access between nine and 12. So we actually do, yes, we are overshadowing. Uh, but we do ensure that that property does achieve an adequate level of solar access. Um, in response to the engineer's comments, those issues have been addressed previously. Um, conscious of time, um, uh, Madam Chair, um, the original report actually acknowledges by Council's traffic people that they had no objections. They were the older referral comments which we've addressed uh, in the submission, so I don't understand why there's a concern. Um, McLaren um, Transport prepared a audit for the site uh, as well as a traffic report and that's come up as being appropriate. Um, the point regarding access, that has been already dealt with in a matter before the Land and Environment Court for this site for a 50 place childcare centre. We're increasing the numbers to 18 uh, by additional 18. Um, and I reference page six of our submission which is in the bundle, which I'm sure you'll read, where we actually gave the six reasons why the court said that access to this site and the way that was approved and the way we're proposing is satisfactory. And that lines up with obviously uh, the McLaren's um, site audit report as well as its traffic management report. Um, panel, um, I guess we're seeking 
a, a, a recomm an approval by yourselves. We don't endorse a recommendation of the panel. Um, I know, I think um, uh, Ms. Morell was part of the previous panel. I feel that the deferral was a, uh, in a way, a acknowledgement that this application was worthy of an approval, uh, subject to additional information. We've provided that additional information. Um, clearly, the officers still don't have that same view, and I respectfully ask the panel to have regard to, you know, obviously what has been provided. There's a lot of information provided. And the last point I'm going to make is that these changes were re-notified. Unlike the original submission, which had 20, um, 28 objections, we only got six objections uh, with this re-notified package. Um, so, as I said to the, uh, as I say to the panel, I think this application is worthy of approval, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Mr. Teresi. Does panel members any questions for Mr. Teresi? Uh, I have one. I noticed in the council's report it refers to um, overshadowing to number 18, and this has been raised by a submitter as well, to yeah. maintain three hours to half the open space. Now, I've just yeah. heard your submission is yeah. that um, maintain solar access to 80 some square metres, I believe you said. Uh, 80 to 111 square metres in between the hours of uh, 9 a.m. and uh, and uh, 12. Now that's council's provision, is it? Control. Uh, the council's DCP uh, yep. specifies, and I do have a copy of the DCP provisions. Um, so in part four of the council's DCP for a dwelling which is greater than 125 square metres, which the adjoining property is, the minimum open space requirement is 80 square metres. Um, now, obviously, of the 50% uh, of 80 is 40. Not that I'm saying that we only provide 40 square metres, but what we're acknowledging is the fact that if you look at the rear yard, um, we're providing 79 to 111 square metres of solar access into that rear yard. Um, as the panel would probably already realise, the existing house extends past the alignment of the uh, adjoining property, uh, and therefore you'll find that the existing house is casting a shadow already to the rear elevation of that building. So we're not making any uh, additional impacts to the rear of that building in terms of that rear elevation. Um, there is an additional overshadowing being cast, obviously, to the private open space. But as if you refer to the shadow diagrams, you'll notice that but at 9am to 12. Um, and I think pretty, it's fair to say to even after to 1pm um, that the majority of that backyard has got solar access. OK, thank you. Uh, and just one other question is with respect to the 2016 court approval. Uh, yeah. That was for 50 places, as I understand it. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Was that prior to the or after the rezoning to R3? Uh, that was prior to. Prior to the rezoning to R3, okay. Yeah, that's correct. And um, there was one other question, and that was with respect to the topography and um, the concern expressed in the report about it doesn't respond to the topography. Um, you've partly addressed that in terms of... Um, the upper level terraces, et cetera, and walls, but would you like to respond to that further? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, uh, um, if you look at the actual plans and there's a number of cross sections, you can see what we've tried to do is provide a little bit of a balance in terms of the way we position the building. That's why the front of the building um, is somewhat lower uh, and that's why some of the terrace area to the back is somewhat higher. Um, what we've also, uh, as I said earlier, we've actually stepped the terrace away from the side boundary, so the terraces do not go to the boundary. The landscape plan has been improved where there is planting along the side of those um, those side boundaries in that immediate area to protect interface, and there's been an acoustic report, and the acoustic report have recommended appropriate treatments, which has been incorporated architecturally in the building. What we've also have done is that we've ensured, um, and you'll see in one of the, and it's probably the best plan to look at it when you do get a chance, and I'll just give you the reference. Um, it's the northern elevation. You'll mm -hmm. actually see that the actual terrace is not a flat terrace. 
we've actually angled the terrace to um, because obviously you know children you don't have to be perfectly flat for a child to play um, so it's it's actually a graded um, terrace area so it's not perfectly flat and that was done from a design point of view to minimize the actual terrace area in terms of overall height um, so the only area we have a, a breach and that is somewhat seen in the 3d image in the package when you look at the rear elevation it's only over uh, the car park entry where it obviously is a little bit more flatter uh, but on the actual northern side where there is uh, a tree and deep soil planting uh, it's actually um, falls with more with the natural ground level mm -hmm. and an amendment to the front fence the front fence has that been removed yeah or? look the front the front fence has been removed uh, there's a reference in the report there is an old notation unfortunately from the original plans when we amended the plans um that notation unfortunately did stay it's a it's a um mm -hmm. it's, there's, there's no front fence proposed um no. there's a there's actually obviously a little mm -hmm. nibble curb you know maybe 100 millimeters high uh, obviously just to deal with the landscaping but it's not meant to be a fence at all mm -hmm. Okay, then. Um, that's all for the moment. I've just got to recharge my phone. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Thanks, um, Mr. Teresi. Any other questions from the panel or comments? Um, not no specific questions from me. It just seems that the objectors to the DA who are supporting the refusal seem to have huge concerns about rear lane access um, by multiple parents. Is there some sort of misinformation that's going on, Mr. Teruzzi, that um, you may be able to enlighten the people who are still listening to appease sure, some sure. of the concerns? Um, if you go to, and, and I'll, I'll, I can say to the community to do the same, if you go to the report, um, although it's page six of the additional information letter, which I um, provided to the council, it is page, I think it's a hundred and, um, bear with me, I think it's a hundred and, a um, hundred and ninety-two of the council's agenda, so they can obviously have a look at that. Uh, That'd be great, thank you. Uh, but, but what that report fundamentally is, as said, and there was a lot of um, work done with the previous approval uh, through the site audit assessment and the traffic report prepared by um, the McLaren um, Transport, um, is that there was a, a view taken that the actual access off the laneway is a far more superior outcome than obviously coming from the street. And that's fundamentally because of, I think, the reasons which have been raised by the actual speakers because of the nature and the width of that street and the school. Um, so the whole development has been focused about internalising um, the car parking. So parents uh, who are obviously, you know, are regular attendees to the childcare centre will access the car park. Um, and then obviously they have direct connection to, um, you know, the childcare within the car park. Um, obviously, we've got a pedestrian connection from the street. Um, we see that being more appropriate because there may be people who uh, live locally who might want to walk to the centre, but there also may be an element of synergy between the, the school opposite, where if a parent is dropping off a child um, and they've already parked in the area because of that school, um, then clearly it makes sense for them just then to walk to the childcare centre. Um, there is an operational plan, so obviously like any of these developments where, although the car park isn't technically public because the people are coming to the site because they're dropping off the children, there's appropriate, um, um, uh, not rules, but procedures in place in terms of how parents drop off the children within the development. Um, so that was what was considered previously under the uh, court approval. Um, that approval is still currently valid. Um, it doesn't actually expire until August of um, 2023. Uh, I did get that question at the previous panel and didn't actually have the answer at the time, but it actually felt within now the COVID provisions, which obviously have now changed, but because it felt within that period, it automatically got an extra um, uh, two years. So now that expires in August of um, 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 2023. 20, um, 
uh, from the applicant's yeah. perspective. Um, just just one sorry. question. In terms of the operational plan that you refer to, is that part, has that become part of the plan of management that forms part of this development application? Uh, or yes. is that a previously um, uh, consented to? Uh, I There's one as part of this development application. Um, and uh, I wasn't. plan of management, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's attached to the bundle. Uh, which the panel have um, for tonight. Mm. Um, I, I, I'm of, I wasn't involved with the original matter before the court, but from memory, um, conversations with the operator, um, there was a similar type of uh, operational management plan as part of that original uh, approval. And if you look at the dot points, as I referred to in page six, the actual judgment in that court matter acknowledged that they, they were satisfied because of those operational uh, procedures being in place, so um, so we we've, we've adopted the same uh, uh, approach and philosophy in this instance as well. So, can you just confirm that the current plan of management that forms part of this DA includes all of those operational matters? Because I guess we're mindful that the number of children with the application before us at the moment is significantly larger, yeah. Yeah. and whether or so, not that operational plan can actually work with the yep. larger numbers of children? Yep, um, the, the actual, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's pages um, of the actual public report. It starts from page 222, which is titled Operational Management Plan. Uh, and then there's a section specifically, which uh, in section 1.6, which talks about the drop off and pick up. Uh, and so, but obviously that's one section, but there's an overall uh, plan which deals more holistically with just hours of operation, the timetable, um, drop off, pick up, uh, as well as security induction, um, uh, as well as you know how the facility will operate in terms of deliveries and waste. Um, now, again, if there's aspects in there which the panel feels we need to potentially expand on, um, there's no issue why we couldn't expand on that. But um, from our view, that seems to have picked up all the um, consultants' reports in terms of all the acoustic issues, traffic issues, and, and they all were a party in terms of the preparation of that plan. Any other questions for Mr. Uh, I, just, I just have one, and there just seems to be a difference of opinion, and I'm just trying to clarify it, in terms of the compliance with the childcare um, requirements, state childcare requirements, um, where does the development sit? I noticed that it's been amended to 68 as opposed to the 71. Was that yep. in order to achieve compliance with all of the requirements or where does it where does it fall down in terms of compliance with those childcare guidelines? Well, um, from my understanding, um, the original concern was relating to um, the number of children to the open space and, yep. we, and that's why the numbers dropped. So from our perspective, that's been resolved. I made comment earlier that in this report, all of a sudden, in the supplementary, there's a reference now to the outdoor provisions uh, in yep. terms of that upper space now being enclosed. But as I articulated, I don't have the same view in the, the way shade, that can, the, 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 yeah, because it's not a it's not a, a veranda. The actual provision in the guideline talks about an enclosed veranda environment. The, the, this is not an enclosed in, in, in environment. Yes, there are two walls on the side of the building, absolutely, um, but there is a shade cloth over that area. Um, it doesn't occupy the whole upper terrace. Um, that's why I've made the comment, if the panel is mindful, they feel that that shade cloth might be too large, we're happy to reduce it. Um, we do have the need under the guidelines to provide um, shading. Um, there's actually, yeah, there's more emphasis on shading. So that's why we've done it in that sort of uh, configuration. So I, my reading of the report, I think that is where the discrepancy is because um, everything else from my interpretation of the guidelines and our proposal, uh, we believe we are compliant. Okay, thank you. That's all, thank you, Chair. Thank you, That's panel. all for me. Thank you. Amber, did you have anything? Um, thank you, Mr. Terissi, very much. Thank you, and, no problems. Uh, thanks again to all of the other speakers this evening.
we're going to finish this part of the meeting and then the panel will continue and reach our determination on these development applications. So if I can formally close the public can I, part I'm, of the meeting. I'm terribly sorry, Chair. It was just that it was the same question was asked to the previous child care centre. Could I ask whether there would be an objection to a community liaison committee? Uh, in yes, order thank you. to ensure and 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 Chair, this is what you raised as well to ensure that um, any concerns um, are addressed. There's a record of same and uh, and one can, can see from the complaints register. Um, uh, there, there'd be no objections from my perspective and I'm sure I can uh, assist uh, the uh, uh, operator in something similar. We've done a number of plans before of a similar nature. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't prepare that, but, uh, but we can certainly introduce it if the panel's mindful. Okay, Thanks, that's all. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Thank Jan. You. All right, well, uh, thank you. And we might uh, close this part of the meeting so I can uh, invite the last speakers to, to leave the meeting and the panel will, as I said, reach its determination and um, put the outcome on the Council's website in the next few days. So thanks very much, everybody, for attending this evening. Thank you.